Welcome, everyone. I'm very happy to have you here. This is Dima Shamoun. I'm the Associate Director of Research at the UT Center for Politics and Governance. And I am very happy that you joined us this afternoon in this chapter, spring chapter of our speaker series. Very excited for today's topic. And today's speaker, Dr. Nathan Jensen, professor at the government department here at UT. And Dr. Jensen's research has been gaining a wide bit of attraction within the academic community and outside the academic community, whether it's from industry affiliates and public figures as well. His research in general focuses on the economic development incentives that are used widely by state governments in, in, the, st in the state of Texas and around the states to attract capital investment and jobs into their respective states. But today's talk is gonna focus on a particular program in Texas, which is chapter 313. The efficacy of the program from a cost benefit analysis perspective and on the bargaining powers between the government and respective industries in Texas. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Nate Jensen. Okay. Great, thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is kind of a complicated audience here. Um, I don't know if this is working actually. Um, in the sense that we have, a, I can just do errors, um, a collection of undergrad students who despite my title uh, still came to this talk. Um, we have a couple of business school faculty in the middle, um, a few other faculty, and then we have people in the industry. Uh, we have you know, lobbyists, uh, economic developers, um, quite a few people in renewable energy here today. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to give enough depth um, that you're not dissatisfied, but at the same time, I'm gonna give some background uh, that might be a little more basic, um, but hopefully we'll get up to speed very, very quickly. And the key point here is this is academic research that's meant to essentially do an analysis of a program. And I started this analysis of the program before I came to Texas. I actually picked this program as sort of a marquee economic de development program in Texas and started doing uh, research and you'll get a sense of how it changed. But actually it was much different than I originally thought when I, when I started the program. Um, I won't give you too much history, but in some sense I'll tell you how often we do an analysis of economic development and why this program's differently. Just real quick, a uh, couple pictures here. Um, we have Samsung, which is the, the, one of the marquee economic uh, development or one of the key investments in Texas and in Austin that came through the 313 program. Um, I'll talk in some detail again what this program is, but when we think about economic development in this program, this is kind of the poster child of, of what people say we want. It's a capital, a capital intensive investment. Samsung's first investment outside of South Korea, or at least the first investment outside of South Korea in the United States, uh, generates a lot of high paying jobs, has spillovers to other companies uh, in, in the local area. Um, San Antonio's Toyota plant is in the middle. Again, this is a recipient of the 313 program. If you're interested in economic development, they're actually recipients of multiple programs, and this gets kind of complicated of identifying which program's responsible. Um, a few of these applicants uh, actually list all the incentives they have at the back of their application in, of this program, and it's six or seven different programs. So it is kind of complicated to identify exactly which program is having an impact. Um, here's a recent city council vote for Merck uh, in Austin. Uh, Merck is is a potential recipient of a relatively small economic development incentive in the city of Austin um, with a lot of stipulations. Austin is very kind of careful on and, and how they, they allocate these incentives. Um, this would be essentially a, a tax abatement, but it would also be coupled with a Texas Enterprise Fund, a cash grant from the state of Texas. Um, and usually the, the Texas Enterprise Fund is roughly 10 times the amount of the local incentive. So you have a small local incentive with lots of stipulations, but in some sense coupled with a larger uh, program. And then we have uh, Texas Wind Farm, that's a recipient of 313. And then we have protests against Exxon um, and they're building uh, in Portland ISD, uh, building a production facility two miles from a school. And you actually have this kind of odd, at least before I knew anything about the program, this kind of odd dynamic that you have a city offering a tax abatement, a tax limitation, an incentive to a company that the citizen doesn't even want located there. And it's this odd dynamic, and some of you who know the details of this, it was this complicated debate about what should the school district do, because the odd thing is, most people thought Exxon was coming no matter what. 
And actually, the way that the formula is for this program, it's actually in a school district's best interest to always authorize the tax abatement. And the simple story is, they don't pay for the abatement, and there's a supplemental side payment on top of it. Happy to talk about the details here, but we get kind of a really interesting mix of different kind of stories that we can tell. Again, a Samsung story, an Exxon story, other sets of stories. I'm trying to do a not investigative journalism. Um, I'm trying to actually do a statistical analysis to say on average, what does this program look like? And then my hope was in starting this program, can I say something then in terms of public policy, which types of programs, which types of incentives are the most useful for the cities, the states to, to allocate? So the idea is really kind of a programmatic evaluation, not an individual um, project evaluation. Um, you know, what's my research question? My research question is really to think about an incentive as a change of behavior. Do we actually get a company coming to Texas that wasn't gonna come anyways? Um, and that's, in some sense, you know, a narrow question. We could actually have other questions. Well, okay, if the company was coming anyways, did we get them to pay better wages? Did we get them to hire more local workers? There's a lot of different dimensions, and I'm being very honest here. I'm looking at a single dimension. Is it coming, is this project coming anyways? And is this incentive responsible for helping bring it here? Which is a hard question. Uh, my answer is, is pretty critical of the program that the majority of the investments were coming anyways. 85 to 90%. And, and I feel a little silly saying this because it's, you know, this actually hurts my research. I'm kind of not saying anything new. Um, there was just a Senate uh, report from the Natural Resources Committee where they had a similar story using more qualitative evidence, looking at patterns. Um, Texas Observer said, well, let's look at the map. And let's look at the map of where these incentives are going, oil and gas and wind. Now there's a mix, there's other programs in there, but I think the key point from the Observer story is that these are geographically constrained investments. Doesn't mean they, they couldn't have gone elsewhere. Many of the applications in Texas that claim they could have gone to, to Louisiana, uh, many of the wind farms said Oklahoma was a potential uh, location. Um, so what I'm trying to do is, is there a more systematic way we can conduct this analysis? How do we know? whether or not these companies were coming. Again, my estimates I have up there and a back envelope calculation of sort of the cost of the program. But I'll get into some of the details. Um, what's the simple story? If you want to evaluate an economic development incentive, how do you know if it works? It's kind of like a college scholarship. If I was offering 10 college scholarships, the Nate Jensen Scholarship, right? Congratulations to a few of you in the room here. You've got the college scholarship. Can I really say that scholarship brought you to Texas? Did I say it brought you to the University of Texas? Can I even say that it lowered your cost of attending college? Well, if you had to forgive, you know, sort of not use another scholarship, then it didn't have any impact. It's plausible that many of you were coming here anyways, and I'm giving you a scholarship that's hopefully at least lowering your cost of coming here. In terms of economic development, we generally don't want to think about subsidizing a company's cost of capital. We don't want to subsidize their investments. What we want to think about is change in behavior that that's usually the mandate of these programs, uh, that the mandate is to actually attract investment. Um, and there's a bunch of ways, and that's what I mean by incentive work. So how do you do this? There's a lot of statistical analysis this is a simple story. We can kind of match companies that got an incentive and didn't get an incentive. And this is kind of hard to do because it's not random who gets them and who doesn't. But sometimes there's ways that we can actually evaluate. There's often a type of incentive, the company that doesn't quite qualify for an incentive and another does. And we can look at their behavior. We also can look at geographic constraints. We can look at borders where Kansas City has Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri. Can we look at changes of programs across this border and does that affect investment? Um, we can also look at the timing of programs. There's a big study in Italy where a bunch of companies, they, they enacted a new incentive program. And it turned out a whole bunch of companies waited to invest until the program was up and running. So it looked like there was a whole lot of new investment. Well, what it really was is companies waiting until this program was, was in place. And then finally, you can directly survey the, the companies and ask them about whether incentives were pivotal or not. Now, there's some obvious biases in, in surveying companies and asking them. Uh, but there's been a bunch of research asking companies if they know how many incentives they have. Can they even identify what level of incentives they had and at what time they had them? Um, what a lot of these general, and I say general it's because it's pretty broad, is that the majority of these studies find that 65 to 75% of incentives don't change real behavior. Again, if you're in marketing, you know, they say half your marketing dollars are wasted. You just don't know which half, right? 
here it's 65 to 70%. But actually what's interesting about the academic research is we have a better sense of what half. We have a better sense of which types of companies are more mobile than others. And those are the types that, that we can uh, look at. Just to give you, an, this is not my study. This is from the controller looking at tax abatements in 2000 in Texas. And this is prior to the program that I'm actually evaluating. And the simple story is they did kind of matching companies, looking at companies in Texas that had this tax abatement and didn't. And the idea was that could they estimate whether or not those companies would have invested anyways. And the top panel are new investments, new companies coming to Texas. And they're finding what's kind of mixed, right? What's the, what's the probability that the similar firm would have formed without this abatement? Meaning these are the companies that definitely that abatement was really pivotal for actually attracting these companies. At the other end, these are the companies that they were probably coming anyways. So we find this kind of interesting mix, just like I sort of identified. But what's interesting is then when you look at expansions, companies that are already here saying, can we get an abatement for another expansion, they find much, much different evidence. And the evidence, you can even see the scale changes. This is a 95% probability that they were going to come anyways. Right, this is 90, the 95, 75 to 90. Basically, their finding was that, again, if you're talking public policy, that it's much more effective to offer these incentives, even with the, the heterogeneity of, of firms' responses to it, on a new investment rather than an expansion. In some sense, this is what I would like to do, is to have more kind of nuanced arguments about what are the best types of investment. Um, and again, there's a, there's a lot of insiders here. You probably have a sense here. What are these, the program that I'm looking at is for giving local property taxes. And how does this work? It's a tax abatement. This program is technically a tax limitation. We can, we can talk about the differences. Tax abatements are very common across states, across cities, across countries. Um, sometimes called tax holidays. Often corporate taxes are forgiven for 10 years. Um, how valuable is it? It matters on how many profits you have. So a lot of companies that are startups, actually that have no profits, that a corporate tax abatement has very little value. But it turns out some of the programs allow you to sell your tax abatement to another company that is profitable. So that the, the details of the program really varies on how valuable it is to a company. But what's interesting, and, and this is where Texas is really unique, in many places the biggest opposition to these abatements are local school districts. And it's because it cannibalizes their tax revenue. Revenues. I lived in St. Louis uh, for quite a, quite a bit of time. Ikea had a big tax abatement uh, to, tr to come to the middle of the city. The school districts were quite upset about this because a large percentage of their tax revenue was completely abated. And there was no formula to compensate them for, for their losses. So you actually see across, across, across states, it's actually the education institutions that are most upset, both school districts, but associations uh, of school districts. And then what you see is a big legal challenge in California trying to stop these programs, these abatement programs, specifically TIFs. City of Chicago canceled them specifically to help fund education. And again, the idea is that this is hollowing out our tax base. So that, you know, the idea though is that we're gonna try to attract a new company and if we don't abate 100%, we give them a 90% abatement, at least we're still capturing some tax revenue. That's often the argument of the proponents of these programs. But again, the school districts on the ground are, have not accepted this argument and in general have been uh, opposition to this. Chapter 313, fast forward here, you know, this is kind of historical data on what's going on. 313 was created in some sense in response to Texas no longer having these abatements at the local level and a couple of big events. Boeing chose to not locate in Texas, and Intel chose to not locate in Texas. And there's a lot of debate whether or not the high taxes, property taxes, were actually pivotal or not. But at least that was the story about the creation of this program, is boy, these are the big capital intensive programs that we want in Texas. And property taxes are too high, and we cannot attract them. The other is that, that Texas fell dramatically in the site selection ratings, like these ratings of, of business locations. Um, you'll see the little footnote. Um, the, the Natural Resource Committee in the Senate actually found that that was a typo in 2001. Um, Texas didn't actually drop from number two to 37. Um, they made a mistake. Now, how pivotal this was, again, to this program being enacted, I, I don't know. Um, and again, in some sense, this isn't my research to go back and say, what are the causes? But, but the point is, what was, at least at the time, the belief of why they should create this? And it's the idea that there's a real burden for capital-intensive investments in Texas, and we have to figure out some way to reduce that cost. 
And given the evidence that they had at the time, this seemed like at least a, a potential mechanism for attracting these investment. So what did they do? They created a program called a limitation, not a tax abatement. And a limitation is, you know, Adam from Condé Nast here was just telling me he just, you know, just bought a house. You know, what if I told you that we will abate all your property taxes above $200,000? Right? So your first $200,000 on your house, you're going to pay taxes. Anything above that, you, know, you pay nothing, which is great. What if I set that level at $10 million? I don't know your income, Adam, but it's probably not $10 million. The point is that anything below that, you actually get no benefit. Anything above that is completely abated. The point is, what's this program look like? Uh, it's big, big investments. And only if you're an investor in a rural area of more than $10 million and a really rich, you know, suburban area of Austin or in Dallas, it's $100 million. So a $90 million investment gets no abatement. A $110 million investment gets that last $10 million of zero taxes. A billion dollar investment gets that extra $900 million. So it's designed specifically for very large, large investments. School districts are pivotal to this, but it's a really complicated system. I told you, school districts generally don't like these programs across states. How do you get school districts on board? They get compensated by the state. They get made whole by the state through the state uh, education formula. So they, you know, they agree to an abatement, but unlike St. Louis where they lose the revenue, they actually get recompensated by the state for it. Um, there's been numerous reforms to the program since 2001, I can talk about that. But the final part, and this is part uh, kind of key, this is again, sounds more like investigative journalism, but it's actually the key to my analysis. Um, actually, school districts can ask for what's called supplemental payments. So a school district saying, sure, Axon, you can build here. Sure, Wind Farm, you can come here. Uh, sure, Samsung, we'd love to have you in the community. They can ask for payments to the school district. And these payments on average across this is about 30% of the tax, uh, the, the tax abatement, meaning a company getting a $10 million tax abatement, a little school district can ask for 3 million of that. So it's a, a program that's very unique in the sense that school districts that get them tend to love these programs. And as someone with a, you know, a child in, in kindergarten in a, in a public school in, in Austin, I sort of understand you know, it's a way for schools to gen generate some revenue. But the odd part is that these supplemental payments are outside of the school finance formula. They're actually often going to the foundations of the school. Um, and it's, it's about 10% of Texas school districts are getting these supplemental payments. A few people have pointed out, you know, this is unfair. Um, this is a weird system. Again, in some sense, I'm using this weird system as a way to kind of identify what's going on between the school districts and the companies, to actually use this as an indicator of something else rather than talking about whether it's a, a good thing or a bad thing. And again, quick thing, Samsung is one of, thought of as one of the most successful cases where Mainer uh, ISD, which is at the time not one of the wealthiest, so it was under the $100 million cap, so $80 million of investment they pay full taxes on. After that, zero taxes on their $2.5 billion investment. Um, I'll tell a couple real quick details, not to, not to bore you. Again, the size of districts I mentioned. What's interesting about this program is there are very little jobs requirements. So the jobs requirements for most of these are 25 or 10 jobs total. So $2.5 billion investment. The point is that I originally came in here wanting to analyze the impact of these pro projects on job creation. And then looking at the details, for the most part, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. And now there's waivers for the majority of the pro projects. So there are a lot of projects that actually propose their you know, $400 million investment and they propose two jobs created. Right? So it doesn't really make sense for me to do the analysis. The program is geared more towards capital than, than job creation. What's also interesting here is that Unlike Texas Enterprise Fund, if you're, if you're following some of the debate on this, economic development programs that require cash, that you need a budget allocation for it. For an abatement, there is no budget allocation. So it is technically, it's unlimited in how much you can offer. You can abate as much as you want without having to go through the budget process. What's important about that is that a small number of companies have you know, seven billion in tax relief to date. And the projections are that this will be about a billion per year in 2022. So big, big, expensive program. Um, and then the majority are renewable energy in terms of projects. And then after that, oil and gas. If you look at the dollar amount, it's actually more oil and gas. The renewable energy projects are a smaller 
uh, smaller size. And then finally, the direct jobs created are 6,500 some. Again, I don't know if that looks like a big number. Compared to 7 billion, it's a very, very small number in terms of job creation. Again, not what I'm doing, but I thought it's useful. Um, what's, what's useful, and I'll, I'll try to you know, skim through this as quickly as possible. Again, what's really unique about this, and I want to use the unique features of this program to get behind the negotiations between the companies and the school districts. One, the size of the benefit is automatic. If your limitation is $100 million, anything above that's tax-free. There's no negotiation over that. Don't tell me how many extra jobs and maybe you can give me some more. It's automatic. All you got to have is a school district that essentially goes yes or no. That's it. Right? So it's turn on or turn off, which actually limits the variation in these, even though the agreements all look different. What a school district can offer a company is the same across every single school district. They can offer you a limitation of this amount. Um, what's interesting about that is the school districts are actually pivotal to, um, to signing these agreements, to monitoring the agreements, be participating in the agreements. But the odd part is these aren't economic developers, right? These are actually people who are you know, educating our children. They're responsible for school finance. But they're now being asked to sort out which companies need an incentive and which don't. So it's an odd system where, in the sense, but that is, in, that is what they're tasked to do. Now, their applications go up to the controller's office in Texas. Uh, and the controller goes through the paperwork and the details. But you see in the, in the kind of the, the legal documents back and forth, it's not really clear who's responsible for verifying this data, for who's responsible for knowing whether the jobs are created or not. Um, so it's, a, it's complicated. The other important thing, and this is really important for my project, even the smallest, poorest rural school district has a professional economic development consultancy working with them. And that's because the, the application fee of 70,000 in the earlier period to 150,000 now can directly go to a consultant for the school district. And, and you can actually find these contracts online. So the, you know, the, the fee is a consultant will negotiate for you for $65,000 plus $10,000 in, in essentially $10,000 a year after that to fill your paperwork. So th there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of details where you actually can use a school finance consultant to help you. Uh, but also they do the negotiation. Why is this important? You have the same small set of consultants interacting in this program over and over and over again. And of the 300 some agreements, I don't know, over 200 are just one consultancy, that they're negotiating school after school after school between different, different companies. Um, what's the conclusion here is that you have school districts that are making a decision of whether or not to allocate this agreement with the help of a consultant. But all these school districts can do again is they can't do anything else other than say yes or no, yes or no. And that's actually in the data, there's almost no no's, right? But that's their role. What's, it, what's important here is that they can ask for supplemental payments outside of the agreement. And these supplemental payments, you can go on the controller's website, are literally in the contracts, saying we agree to give this percentage of our taxes to you as part of this agreement. Um, these are you know, a couple examples that are from some observer stories about you know, football field being, being bought by supplemental payments, but also investments in the local, uh, the local education institutions. There's lots of ways that schools could use these supplemental payments. Again, all I'm trying to, to look at is, again, is there any variation in these supplemental payments? Does every school district using the exact same consultants, getting the exact same types of investment, do they get the same amount? Or is there variation? And like I said, the average is about 30%. What I actually argue is that they do vary. I mean, I can show you that they do vary. But why do they vary? And the key reason is that they mostly vary because some companies can say, no, you're asking for 40% of my tax, my, my tax incentive? No, I'm Samsung, goodbye, right? I actually did some interviews on this and saying, yeah, I mean, they use much worse language in some of these negotiations, saying, no, we're not gonna pay this amount. We have multiple options. This really is important for us to locate here. We need this to financially to either allocate capital within the company or to make this location decision. We are comparing you to Louisiana and we're comparing you to Tennessee. We need this amount and that's the tax abatement that we expect. And, you, and then in others that you could imagine a company that is completely dependent on a location. I'll talk in the example later. There's some companies that started building before they put in their application. They are not mobile, right? 
there's actually one company that filled an application, built their project, went back and realized that they didn't fully file the paperwork. Three years later, another company bought it, and they went back and said, hey, actually, we'd like that agreement. Right? This is really pivotal for us to locate here. They got it. They actually got the agreement. They also paid a very large supplemental payment to the school district. The point is that the school districts, or the consultants for the school districts, can extract more in the supplemental payments, the less mobile the company is. This is key to my, my research, so hopefully this makes sense. And again, I'm not taking a normative stance on supplemental payments, uh, good or bad and different. The point is that it's really unique, but this unique feature gives us this really odd window into what's going on between the school districts. Yeah, they're not that unique. What's that? They're not that unique. The supplemental payments? Yeah, the pilot payments. That's a very common technique. I mean, that's used across the Midwest. I, would, I mean, I would love to. Yeah. There's going to be a Q&A time, but I just can't allow that to continue. No, I, lo I love it. There's this really uh, common yeah. the pilot payments. I mean, I would, I would love to extend this. Sure. I'd love to extend this to other, other states, so I'd love to talk to you about this. I know Iowa, for example, uh -huh. and Indiana. I mean, it's, it's terribly common. That's great. That's great. Well, I don't know if it's great, but, but it's great to hear that you know, we can extend this. What, what was key for this project is not just supplemental payments, same consultancies and the same tax benefit. So the, the, the key for our, this research design is to keep it as kind of limited as possible, limit as many variables as possible uh, so we can understand what these supplemental payments are doing. Um, and just to give you a sense, if you're looking at these blobs saying, I can't, that doesn't make any sense. It, exactly, these are supplemental payments here as a percentage of tax benefits. This is how much employment the companies are generating. Meaning, you could maybe tell me that you're willing to give more supplemental payments to a company that's going to generate a lot of jobs in your district. It just doesn't fit that pattern. If anything, sometimes the, the, the companies that generate the most jobs are going to place the biggest burden on the school districts. You could actually imagine in, uh, the opposite relationship. We just don't see that. We just don't see this in the data. And then also the size of the investment. And again, you could just think about negotiation strategies. We are a big, big multinational, and we have lots of potential options. We have you know, a $4 billion investment. Do you want it or not? And the point is we still don't see a whole lot of variation in supplemental payments, mostly because these are large, all really large companies. Right? They also are very good negotiators, but also the school districts have the same set of relatively small number of highly professional, knowledgeable consultants. So we don't see any, and I can talk about the statistical analysis, we just don't see anything directly uh, in, the re in the relationship. Yeah? Before we leave the graphs, I wanted to ask the time period of your data set, because I believe there is a cap for supplemental payments at $100 per student. Yeah. And that, that cap came later on in the program. Yeah, this is great. Is data only looking early, or does it show through current times where it is standardized per head? Yeah, so this is a great question. So one of the legislative changes was actually limiting. And again, being an outsider, I was kind of shocked. I was like, you're protecting these big companies from small school districts? There's a cap placed on how much school districts could get from these companies. And, and this, the, this is actually from 2002 to 2014. In the statistical model, we actually both, I segment the data as the earlier and later, but also in the statistical model, take into account the, the, the time period. What's actually interesting is it actually biased the results against finding more redundant investments. Meaning there are a whole bunch of these contracts, if you go through the contracts, that a company says, this is the, the, the Portland ISD Exxon, they wrote in the contract, if we could give you 40% of our taxes, we would give you 40%. Or they actually, what they did is this backfill clause where we're only allowed to give you $100 per pupil. If that ever gets lifted, we will go up to 40% of our of our total tax benefit. So, the, so actually there's bias here that I think there would be more in this data that would actually be at 40% if we go to the, contra if we go to the contracts. But this is not differentiating by time, which is important. Uh, and important, it made it actually harder for, for the kind of methodology when you get this break. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but it's a, it is a great question. And this is one of the big reforms of the program. Brian, you look confused by this. One of the, yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about it in a, in a second. What I can do is let's talk about the early projects. And what are the earliest projects? Um, I was using, and this is, it's always a little odd to use a quote, but we had an economic developer um, who was involved in essentially all the early projects. And this is the same, uh, the same uh, education consulting law firm that was involved in, I don't know, over 200 of these projects, saying, 
honestly, which projects he thought was pivotal, 313 was pivotal, and which ones weren't. And the simple story is, like, this is just a quote, right? But my whole story is I think supplemental payments should vary on how pivotal 313 was for attracting the investment. And what we find here is, you know, he says four out of 34. What's the distribution? Of the four listed here, the average amount of supplemental payments is about 2% of the tax benefits. So they get almost nothing. The rest of the sample, it's about 35%. This is the period before there was a cap. So there's actually a 65% for one of the school districts. There's a few 50% in here as well. That is no longer possible, right, um, in, in the context of the, of the later agreements. The whole point is that I'm trying to validate this supplemental payment measure and say, does it actually map on to uh, how mobile the firm is. The other is I do an elite survey. Um, I contacted individuals who had lobbied on, taken public positions, or worked in economic development in some of these, on some of these projects, and gave them essentially the list of my projects, which was at the time 257 projects, and just a spreadsheet, and said, can you tell me which ones you think were pivotal? 313 was pivotal in bringing here, and which projects it was not pivotal. And using this, this survey, Essentially, then, I'm trying to, again, use it just as a check on the supplemental payments. And the idea is to see, again, what does this map onto? Now, this is across the whole time period, right? So there are a lot of projects in the later ends uh, where, it, where it's not clear, you know, again, what, what they would have paid in supplemental payments. The elite survey, I actually didn't tell them anything about supplemental payments. I just gave them literally the list of the company's location, the school district. Um, and then I used oh, cases where we have agreement across coders. Uh, uh, across elites and use this to calibrate the model. This actually looks slightly better for the program, actually, this elite survey, than the, the quote that I showed before. Um, but the point is that 82 of the agreements, I got to vote one way or the other whether or not the developers thought it was pivotal. Uh, there are about 20 agreements uh, that they thought it was actually it was effective in bringing investment to Texas, and the other 60, uh, some were not pivotal. Again, the point is to calibrate a model based on this, to use essentially a regression, and Brian will probably ask me details on this later, to essentially use an aggression to identify the relationship between supplemental payments and whether or not it was pivotal for these agreements, and then use controls for school district to know what the school district, where it sort of sits in the school district finance formula, to know the industry, to know the time, and also to know when the, com the school district was butting up against this limitation on how much, they could, uh, how much they could give. So I have enrollment data, so I can look at which school districts are actually capped and how much they, uh, how much they can get from the companies. And then run a statistical model using a prediction across all this. So you know, the first one is, again, I did a model, how do supplemental payments map on to, um, map on to whether or not it was pivotal. And the point is that we see using the different samples, on average, you could say that in the early periods, a company that was mobile paid four, five, six percent of their taxes and supplemental payments. And then we get about 30, 35, 40 percent for the other companies. Then when we look at the full sample, this tightens again for the question for the exact reason that was just asked. It tightens where the difference is about 11 percent edge points. So what you see is that most of these, the average being closer to 20 percent of the tax benefits. But you get a variation between 10 and 30 percent, or actually it's more, more like a variation between 15 percent and 25 percent. So you still see this big difference, but it is much more muted because school districts are capped and how much they can get uh, in later periods. Turns out that that's the only predictor of supplemental payments. I can't find any model that helps predict which companies are giving. And often we have the same company in some cases in different locations with the same consultants offering different levels of supplemental payments. Um, what's, what's the point here? Why do I use the key is that I want to use supplemental payments in a model to, to see whether or not 313 was necessary. Um, if you're not into statistics, I'm going to give a bunch of stories at the very end and give you a sense of where we're going to go with this project next. But the simple point is, you know, using these cases that we know, we're trying to extend out of sample predictions on, on what we think is going to happen. Um, the simple story is that this is from the media quote of the earlier period. If we use that data, those four cases, where we think it was pivotal. In general, this means the zero means, what's the probability that 313 was necessary? 60% of the estimates are literally at zero, right? And we have this distribution of very few kind of over here, 
And then this is using the elite survey. And again, the elite survey looks a little better in some sense, but you have to note that the scale is, is different as well. So we get, you know, a few more pivotal projects. And this is, it's kind of hard to summarize, like what is that? Well, it's a distribution, right? You can eyeball the distribution. I say it's kind of 80, 85 to 90% were coming anyways. It's kind of what cut point you have, right? And, and you can make that own, your own decision on that. The point is, you know, for me in this project is to say like, it kind of fits the intuition of what other people have said about the program, is that there are a whole lot of these projects that were coming anyways, and it is very predictive by their, by their supplemental payments. A um, Couple other quick additional findings, and then I'm just gonna say something about future research, which might give you some more background on, on the program. One is that simply, you know, in these applications, and I did a uh, public records request for the earlier applications that aren't public, um, about 65% of the applications indicate another state is a competitor. Um, if you kind of do research in economic development, this isn't a surprise, but there's been a lot of criticism of these programs of just shifting investment across state borders. So it may make sense rationally for a state to compete like this, but looking back, saying, boy, this is really just shifting investment across states. It's not bringing in new investment in the United States, or it's not incentivizing new, new expansion. But isn't that the point of the program for the state of Texas? Yes, and this is exactly, no, no, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. That's the goal of the program, is to bring investment to Texas. There's been a bunch of economists have asked, is this good overall? You know, sometimes you can say competition is, is value enhancing. And there's been a lot of studies about uh, governments in the developing world, actually corruption being a tax on business can actually pressure them to reduce their corruption, to re reduce bribery and business behavior. That competition leads to a more efficient outcome. A lot of the economists have said, well, this, it's not clear that this is more efficient, that net in the United States that we're getting more. But you're exactly right. The motivation is exactly uh, to attract investment. And that's the mandate, right, of the Texas politicians. Um, and then the other is, you know, and this is maybe me just heartfelt here a little bit. You know, I, I can imagine the school districts being in a very difficult position where you're tasking them to say yes or no. But I've seen the consultant reports. I mean, you should always say yes. Right, given the finance, the, the school finance system, even without the supplemental payments, this is a pretty attractive deal, right? And this is Portland ISD has their data all online, including presentations by the consultants saying, they actually don't even really talk about the scenario that the company might not come. Company's coming, if you give them a 313, this is what you get. If you don't, this is what you get. And it's a lot bigger if you offer this, this, um, this abatement. So, systematically you can see a problem here when you have school districts that are not economic developers strapped for cash put in a position to do this and again that's more that's not my research it's just my heart felt when i kind of see this and say wow i can imagine these school districts being in a very difficult position voting for an exxon plant that's actually really close to your school that people don't want but it really is going to help you, you know, help you finance, finance education. What's the next steps? And this, this might give you something. Um, but it, I guess I should say, again, legislative changes of cap, supplemental payments. We talked about this very, very briefly. Um, when I asked these experts that, and again, it's a small number of experts, um, I asked them about what they knew, where their expertise was. There was a lot more, and this is just kind of, kind of qualitative, uh, kind of, you know, talking them on the side, like, what do you know? What do you know about these projects? They seemed a lot less confident in their knowledge of the wind, wind projects. So, and a lot of the ratings were not on the wind projects. A lot of them were on the oil and gas or manufacturing. So this is just kind of an honest caveat that I, I would like to go back through the data and see to what extent that that really maps onto wind. The other is, you know, I have an elite survey. Are these my buddies? Maybe it's these guys, business school people. How do you know who I did? Well, it turns out that this is exactly one of the problems with elite surveys. Human subjects requires me to shield the identity of respondents for good reason, right? There's a lot of people who could lose their jobs, right? There are people who might not want to identify who they are, or if they're forced to identify who they are, that they might answer differently. So I'm going to talk again about what I can do about these caveats, but that's kind of an honest, you know, honest concern, right? How do you know what's behind this? The only good news I can tell you is that the elite survey is actually more optimistic about the program than the media report that I used earlier. The Moak and Casey here are the four projects, right? So they kind of map on to each other. What's the future steps? One is that I have an application to the Texas Workforce Commission to do micro-level data work, which has been sitting for a while. Um, I also bought some data where I can verify job creation for these pro projects. Um, and there's a lot of concern. One, that 
these companies may not be creating jobs. Two, they might actually be underreporting how many jobs they, were, they actually have. And that's because to participate in this program, you're supposed to pay 110% of the wages. But you only have to pay those wages for the, for the jobs that you actually proposed. So if you're going to generate 100 jobs, but you're going to be below the wage threshold, then just put 10 on the application and pay those 10 people in the white, the white collar jobs in the office enough and the 90, 90 pay them whatever you want. Right? So there is some concern about this. But like I said, I don't think employment's the big issue. What I would like to do, and I'm going through these applications, was literally doing this before, is what smoking guns can I kind of convince you again about, other than elite surveys, other than a media report, that some of these projects were coming to Texas anyways. And again, this is an investigative journalism. It's to look and show you again how this maps onto supplemental payments. Uh, one, there's a bunch of applicants that actually say in their applications we're only looking in Texas. They actually list only other Texas locations, which should have disqualified them from the program, but they went through. Right? So there's, I think, only three of these, but it's supposed to be to attract new investment to Texas. Right? Um, the other is that there are a number of applications where they had already begun construction. Um, these are some companies' in expansion. They put in an application, and then they had to put an amended application to the controller saying, yeah, yeah, we got 20 million on the ground, actually. We've actually started construction. Again, to me, and I'd, I'd be curious what you, what you have to say about this. This looks, again, like a company that's already committed uh, to building and investing. Um, we also have a few wind farms that actually had applied, again, well before, or sorry, that started building well before um, actual, their actual application. In some cases, there was one that had actually applied in November because of an expiration of a federal wind tax credit and was built in, done in December. And then we found the ground breaking for the wind project was actually an Earth Day in April. So they were already building from April until November when they put in the application. Right? Again, this seems like a, a, a program that is not attracting that wind farm. There's a court case, the classic nuance uh, court case, uh, Jim Ned ISD, where there's a court case that people are complaining about the sound of the wind farms in February. And then the company applies in August about the wind farm they're going to build. Right? Again, this, is, this, this project paid 40% of supplemental payments. Again, if you're on the ground as a school district, you see it already being built. There's very little negotiating room. And then we have a couple others, um, including, again, this is only specific for wind. Um, there's a lot of data on wind power construction documents from the FAA. There's a big New York Times story about this, looking at the economic stimulus bill and, and which projects were already built and which projects um, were, were built after and the stimulus actually generated the investment. Um, this document, it's, it's pretty unwieldy because it's, it's actually tower by tower data. But in some sense, we can identify exactly when towers are going up and how it maps on, um, how it maps on. Google Earth also, again, we can look at construction that's happened before. And again, this is a really high bar. These are projects that I'm going to show you that are already being built before they have their incentive application. So that doesn't include the projects where they're smart enough to hold back until they get the incentive. So it's a high bar, but I've already found out of the first 85 projects, 80, 88 projects, I found about 35 that, that fit this criteria um, so that they're building to some extent. And again, the idea is to map this on to supplemental payments to show whether or not supplemental payments is a good metric uh, for, for analysis. I know that that's a lot to absorb uh, in the afternoon. Thank you very much. We can start the Q&A session. Uh, for purposes of the recording, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, and I'm going to give you the mic. Um, hi, Nate. Just for everyone else, my name is Luke. I'm a, a PhD candidate in government. I'm also one of the graduate fellows with CPG. Getting kind of at your last future steps um, and looking at the this question about how many companies are coming anyway, have you looked at what happens when companies don't get the abatement, whether or not they still come, um, and, and if they don't, you know, where do they go? Yeah, so this is a great, great question. There are almost no companies that get a no answer. Um, it's really, really rare in this program partially because of the school finance uh, reason. There's a few LNG plants that actually either had no's or they were kind of new, there was no, and it was still built. But it's a very small number. 
So I wouldn't be very confident on, uh, this is actually a problem across states evaluating these programs. Usually a, a project that knows that they're gonna get rejected isn't gonna apply in the first place. And there's not enough kind of random, kind of on one side you barely qualify and the other side you don't to make that, make that clear. I would love to do that, but it's, it's not clear that that's something easy to do. So following what you just said, they don't usually apply if they're going to get a no. These projects that you touched on at the end that are already starting to build before they apply, was this happening after 313 had been established? And I mean, you weren't seeing things being built and then applying like when 13, 313 was in process, right? There are... So I started looking at the documents, and I specifically looked at applications in 2002 when before there was a transparency bill that actually put all these applications up. And these, and these bills, for the most part, since 2007 are all public. The pr ones prior to that are, are not public. So I did a public records request looking at what do you see in the documents in this earlier time period. So that's all I've gone through are the first 88 out of 311 projects, and those first 88, there are a few, actually a few projects that said they started building before 2001, and now there's this program, right? You see some of that, but you actually find some later on in the, in the time period, and, and honestly, it is a little perplexing to me why some of these companies would do this. Um, again, one of these projects where they built it, the school district never forwarded the application, a new company buys them three years after the original building, they actually asked for their abatement, their limitation for the first part of the project. And then, they say, and by the way, we're actually building more, right? We want an abatement for, for this. So, so it's actually, I'm looking at, so there are some that are, are a few years, enough years out um, that I'm a little surprised. Like, you know, this program's here. Why would you, why would you wait on this? Um, so, so they're building sort of banking on that. They wouldn't necessarily have built. I mean, that's plausible. It is plausible that they're banking on it. I'm trying to compare, though, the, the number of, of projects. Wind, again, is a good one, but we can think of oil and gas, LNG, that actually don't have 313s. And it's kind of funny, the, the large number of projects that actually don't go with a 313. And again, that's kind of perplexing to me as well. What is exactly going on there? Why some are, uh, some are and some aren't? So you're right, they, they could be anticipating. Um, but from a school district perspective, if you're a school district and you see a wind farm already producing or an oil and gas with already, um, with already essentially an expansion, they know, right? They know. They just want to find a new consultant. <laughs> it's plausible. I didn't mention that one of the school districts has someone who's a consultant now, Moonlighting, as an economic developer. So one of the school districts now, uh, now has got in the consulting game now that there's lots of money. Sorry, Charlie. You, uh, you mentioned your data set goes through 2014. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Um, from the, the solar power industry, just wanted to offer, so solar wouldn't have really been in, in your data set since the solar agreements have only come in in the last couple of years. That's right. I think there's, yeah, I'm trying to think how many solar, two, I, yeah. I'm not sure exactly how many, there are very few solar projects. And honestly, I quickly, I'm not an expert, quickly, you know, boned up on the economics of wind and, and interviewed some, some economists working. And even that, you know, was outside. I originally did thought I was focusing mostly on manufacturing. So the solar plants as well are, are very different. Yeah, and I can offer that for, for solar plants, it's certainly critical. There's a lot of competition among states. 40 states have state level policy for solar and um, it, it's incredibly pivotal. Even the, pro, the, the solar projects that have 313 agreements now, only some of those have come to, to completion as, as being built because the 313 agreement is kind of necessary but not sufficient. Even that is not a guarantee the project is happening because the, the competition is so tight. I have a question. So am I correct in concluding that it's not a poorly structured program but whoever was responsible for accepting or rejecting applications just wasn't doing a very good job? Boy, that's a that's who's to blame? Is that my 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 wife works in the actual innocence clinic, um, and she actually says that's the worst way to think about someone who's innocent going to prison. It's to think about the process. How do we avoid this in the future? So who's to blame here is is more complicated. I think what's interesting here is like a systematic. Does a school district that knows a company is coming, or the controller's office that thinks a company is not coming, do they have the incentive to say no? 
Can they say no? Should they say no? Is it financially in their interest to say no? We're not putting those tax dollars out. And this program systematically is flawed and flawed in that way. Where you can think about a lot of local, other local economic development programs, they're raising a sales tax and they're allocating their money to a company. I mean, that's a different calculation for our local, local body than, than something like this. So, so I don't know if that answers your, your question. I don't know who's, who's to blame, but the, but the structural, there are structural problems with essentially too many, yo too many yeses overuse of the program for some that, you know, as Charlie mentioned, maybe there's some solar projects that really need it, right? And it's in the same program across many different industries. I always find it odd to see solar, wind, and oil in the same project. I, again, I was walking in here being very naive, saying it's an odd mix of, of projects. Uh, the point is, you know, if we wanted to reform the program, ideally we could identify which industries it's most pivotal for uh, and, and make those sort of reforms. Who do you think is actually paying for the abatements? Who's paying for the abatements? Well, us, uh, I don't know, Texas taxpayer. Um, you know, this is, comes through the school finance formula and this is notoriously difficult to estimate. So certain local economic development programs in Texas are funded by sales tax, which is a regressive tax. So you can kind of talk about who the distributional implications are. These abatements are much more difficult because they're coming from the state and it's much harder to identify what the trade-offs are. I actually think that this makes these projects politically more difficult to dismantle or change because it's not clear who exactly. In other schools or under other states where school districts lose, they fight against these programs. You actually don't see a whole lot of opposition to this program other than kind of ideological opposition because it's not so clear who are the exact. I mean, it's a just classic political economy argument, dispersed. There are lots of Texans paying some amount of money, businesses, individuals, for a program that, that is costly and, and potentially not very effective. I don't know if that's a, too much of a dot. You, you are, uh, and, and me. Hi, Nate. Um, just a, a data question. Um, have you tried to validate your expert surveys with your like, objective list of projects that seem to have started early? Like, Were the experts ever wrong? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there, and there was some disagreement in the experts, I should say this. Um, there are a couple, not a lot, but there are a dozen or so where we didn't put them in the analysis because there was disagreement. That's exactly the, the goal. And I was literally working this morning still trying to code up all this data uh, because in some sense it's um, how do you know, you know what, when do you stop looking? And you look at a project and, and there's a project that I thought, oh, this seems legit. And then I actually saw a New York Times article about the company and when they were bought and then when construction started. So, you know, again, I'm through about 80, about 80 projects or so. Um, and the hope is that I'll eventually get through, get through all of them. But, but that would be the hope is that I can use it as, uh, as a supplement to what I've done thus far. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us here today. I, it was a pleasure to have you all. And Nate, thank you so much for this fascinating okay. research. By the way, we have a uh, summary handout of uh, Nate's research in the back if you would like to grab one before you leave. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nina.